Uh, hi, thank you for attending our talk. I wish we were able to see you in person and hope that in the next year the things will get back to normal. As you can see from the title, the topic is very important because the internet, the biggest storage of all your funny pictures and memes runs on electricity. And we are here to talk about uh, internal so power generation automations, about vulnerabilities that we are able to find, and uh, about what you can do about that. We are security consultants who have been working with different industrial solutions for many years. Actually, we have been doing it for so long that uh, we have a long list of contact information of different system integrators and industrial vendors. So when an asset owner, for, for instance, a power plant comes to us and ask for a service, uh, we don't just give them information about vulnerabilities that we found. We closely work with all involved entities, including the vendor, to, uh, to find together safe and reliable fixes and workarounds. We work at Kaspersky, and this research is a result of the teamwork, not just of the three of us, uh, but also of Gleb Gritsai, Sergey Andreev, and Sergey Sidorov. Everything that we are going to discuss today was reported to the respective vendor, I'm talking about Siemens, a long time ago. Uh, but actually, this is not uh, one vendor problem. Uh, you can find similar issues in systems of other vendors as well. We are going to talk about real vulnerabilities in real power plants out there. And at the first glance, it may seem irresponsible. Uh, but if you think about it, um, for good guys to do such research, uh, uh, it's a challenge. You would need to uh, have uh, relevant experience. Uh, you will need to have uh, a lot of time. And you, of course, you will need access to the industrial environment. So um, there is no Wilkins welcome sign on power plants doors, right? Uh, so for good guys, for penetration testers, for auditors, for power plant separators, it's uh, challenging to uh, get access to all of the things together. On the other hand, for bad guys, for those bad guys who would be willing and able to attack a power plant, um, it's their daily job to do such research. Uh, they have significant investments, they have a lot of time, but they keep their vulnerabilities to themselves for their malicious purposes. So we assume that those guys already have all this information and from our side, we would like to share this information with good guys with you, so you would be able to act upon this. Power plants is uh, the main source of uh, electricity on our planet and thanks to carbon monitoring, anyone with internet access can get information about where are different power plants located on the world map, uh, what fuel they use, and which is their capacity. The heart of every power plant is a turbine. Uh, we don't have a picture of a turbine here, but if you ever saw a modern airplane, I believe you also saw a turbine. This is a giant rotating sink generating electricity. Uh, so, uh, and on power plants, they look uh, and work quite similarly. Um, and uh, turbine manufacturers are generous enough to share information where the turbines are used. Here, for example, a screenshot from a Siemens website. Um, turbines are used not only on power plants, uh, they are used in many different areas like chemical or oil and gas and many others. Uh, but if you correlate this picture with the previous one, you will be able to understand a solution from which vendor is used on a particular power plant. In addition to that, uh, online you can find a lot of information about uh, what solutions are used in certain power plants, in different press releases and marketing materials. Uh, you can find uh, a lot of interesting information about software, hardware version, generations of different systems. Uh, sometimes you can even find building plans. Here, just a small example. Okay, Google, show me some power plants of California. Here are just a few uh, power plants of California, and they have uh, one more thing in common. Uh, they use the same plant control system, SPPAT 3000 from Siemens. 
this is exa exactly the system uh, that we are going to discuss today. But before we move on to uh, power plant generation, uh, automation, let's talk a little bit about uh, power generation process in general, uh, what we are going to automate. Um, here uh, and throughout the presentation, we will be intentionally oversimplifying a lot of things. Uh, partially to make them more suitable for the audience and partially because, to be honest, we don't fully understand them ourselves. So let's go from right to left. Um, uh, at first, you will need some fuel. Here is coal, for, exa for example. You put fuel into a combustion chamber, put it on fire, and it generates pressure to rotate a turbine. The turbine is connected to an electricity generator through a shaft, so when it's rotating, the generator starts generating the electricity. But it's important to mention that electricity doesn't go straight to your house or a city. Uh, at first, it goes to a special place called power grid. Uh, power grid knows information about market demands. It receives energy from different power plants. And this is power grid who distributes electricity to consumers. During uh, the burning process in the combustion chamber, uh, you can have a lot of excessive heat, so called, called waste heat. And there are different ways how to approach it. You can release it to the air through a condensing tower, uh, or you can reuse it to recuperation. Uh, for example, warm water and send the steam to a turbine to generate more electricity. Systems uh, that are used to automate this process are called distributed control systems or DCS. Um, they are designed to make life of power plant operators much, much easier. Uh, they allow you to conveniently start and stop the power generation process. They allow to control the amount of electricity you want to generate. You just enter the, the amount in megawatts that you want to have in the, in the output and they allow you to monitor everything. Uh, these systems are literally very powerful. Uh, they uh, are connected through, they, through PLCs. They're connected to many parts of the plant, including the turbine, and they uh, control such interesting things as the amount of fuel, the temperature of the combustion in the combustion chamber, uh, the rotation speed of the turbine, and even uh, control uh, the turn by um, not to go into different dangerous modes. Obviously, it's not a small piece of software that you just install on a server and it magically works. It's a very sophisticated system consisting of different hardware, software, PLCs, um, input output modules, the turbine itself, and a lot, a lot of things. Uh, and often starting to create such a system starts even from building construction. So someone comes to a vendor and says, we have an empty field, please build us a power plant. And there are many vendors who do this, but today we, are talk we will be talking about Siemens. The DCS from Siemens that we analyzed is called SPPAT 3000. Just like other DCSs, it uh, consists of many different industrial components, uh, PLCs, LPC, uh, different servers, HMI, uh, a lot of things. And it may have very different architecture depending on the site. Uh, but uh, there will be two components that are unique for SPPAT 3000. They are called application server and automation server. And this is how we will structure our talk. At first, we will talk about application server, then we will move on to automation server, and then we will move on to conclusions. Um, in different manuals and documentation from Siemens, you will see uh, how the system should be built in a perfect world. But for example, they will still say that the application network where application server is located uh, should never be connected to any external networks and how everything should be designed. Uh, however, uh, also uh, we, again, here very oversimplifying everything. Um, you know, in reality, in real power plants, you will meet a lot of interconnections to other systems. For example, you will need a sensor network uh, to monitor different vibrations inside a turbine. Uh, you will need a demilitarized zone because you will need to 
uh, get some kind of remote support from the vendor. You will need to get updates for your operating systems, for antivirus, and so on. Uh, you will need to push out OPC traffic to your corporate network or to a regulator because this area is very strictly regulated. So in practice, you will need a lot of uh, interconnections. The life of our vulnerabilities started almost two years ago. Back in November 2018, we reported a bunch of vulnerabilities to Siemens. And about a year later, Siemens published uh, an advisory containing uh, information about how to approach these vulnerabilities and also a set of other vulnerabilities that were reported by other vendors, uh, other teams. And that's great that this area receives a lot of attention from security researchers. But also uh, about a year passed, it doesn't mean that during this year Siemens uh, didn't do anything. Um, and the thing is, SPPT 3000 is an exclusively supported system. It means that a system integrator for, for this uh, is Siemens themselves. So soon after we reported this vulnerability, Siemens started to roll out patches and working directly with uh, their clients to fix everything. Uh, so December is just when this information became public. We don't have a lot of time to discuss in detail uh, what kind of attacker, what you can do with the system. Uh, I will just highlight that uh, CVSS scores given here uh, obviously do not represent uh, how uh, critical these vulnerabilities for real uh, power generation process. They're just uh, individual um, scores for vulnerabilities in the vacuum. Uh, to better understand what kind of attacker uh, can do what, you can take a look at our threat model uh, that is published in our white paper. Let's uh, start with application server. Application server is a logical core of the entire system. Uh, uh, everything uh, has connections to application servers in, in the logical sense. Uh, if anything needs to connect to the network, it will end up in application server. Other servers start their work from the loading software from application server and launching it. So this is the heart of the system. And what can possibly go wrong if you uh, open over 40 ports there? Um, this is uh, for an attacker. This is a huge attack surface. Uh, if they are lucky to get into their respective network, they can choose what they want to attack. Do they want to attack uh, Windows operating system because this is simply a Windows server? Do they want to attack third party components? Or they want to attack own SPP 83000 services which are based on Java? Um, uh, also, we hope that these vulnerabilities are already fixed. Uh, in industrial environment, usually you don't update uh, your systems very often. Usually it's uh, about a half of a year or several months between uh, update, major updates of operating system. So it's always possible to find a time window uh, to, um, of, uh, with uh, remotely exploitable vulnerabilities in Windows operating system. Configurations also could be better. You can find some statistics for security benchmarks on the right hand side. Uh, but the, one of the biggest problems is actually passwords. Uh, the life of passwords uh, can, can, has uh, three stages. At first, passwords were the same for all power plants. They were default and the same everywhere, and you can find them online. Um, obviously, the screenshot were not uh, from information published from Siemens. Uh, some power plant operators decided that it would be a good, good idea to share uh, passwords and a lot of other technical information with, with the internet. Uh, but they're available online, and we also have um, a world list, uh, a world list in our white paper. Uh, around 2014, 2015, um, Siemens started to generate different passwords for different locations. However, uh, the process of changing them was challenging. You would have to be familiar with the process to change the passwords by yourself. Uh, and only in the last year, in 2019, uh, the process became easier and now you can do it yourself uh, much easier. Uh, now please welcome Radu, who will tell you about uh, vulnerabilities in Java. Hello, everyone. Uh, uh, 
so um, uh, let's look how SPP software works on application server side. Uh, operator can communicate uh, with system through thin or fat clan. Uh, in case of thin clan, uh, it uses um, Java Play of uh, Internet Explorer and uh, communicates uh, with server or with HTTPS. So it can be uh, outside of application network and its communication can be constrained by firewall. In opposite, uh, in case of fat client, operator should belong to uh, application network and uh, its uh, and fat client uh, directly communicates with RMI registry to found uh, RMI services and after that directly communicates uh, with uh, these services. Uh, so, um, Um, illustration of SPPI architecture was kindly provided by system through public URL, so not to be messed, let's divide it into spaces. Uh, in, gray, in red zone, there are items that process HTTPS requests, uh, and in green zone, there are uh, RMI services. RMI service looks like network services, which are served on uh, dynamic TCP ports. Uh, SPPI consists of uh, containers, all types of containers are represented on these illustrations, and containers um, have has uh, self-explanatory names. So before we go on deep inside uh, internals of SPP, let me introduce uh, some uh, tools which used in this research. First of all, all JARS files of SPP are obfuscated with commercial uh, product, but this security measure can simply bypass by uh, public available tool. Secondly, sometimes it is useful to see how legit software communicates uh, with server. It helps to understand architecture and uh, uh, to see client workflow. In case of SPPA, RMI Dissector was written. Uh, it uh, represents raw TCP streams and in human readable format. Inside, it used a uh, read object uh, method of SDK. It is known that this method uh, is suffer from uh, insect of desertization vulnerability. So be sure not to be exploited through remote pickup. Uh, the first pillar of SPPA is Apache Web Server. According to its configuration, folder Orion Software Config can be accessed by an authorized user. But in fact, this folder contains some critical information about uh, application and uh, uh, about items of application and automation network. Also, uh, configuration of uh, Orion web application in Tomcat also can be accessed. Uh, Tomcat, uh, there are three web applications registered in Tomcat. Uh, uh, there are remote diagnostic service, manager, and Orion. According uh, uh, configurations of uh, Apache and Tomcat, uh, all this uh, application can be accessed by an authorized user. And um, inside Orion web application, there are servlets which can be accessed. All of them are listed in um, configuration web.xml, and the list is uh, huge. Uh, some of, uh, some of uh, servlets has attractive names for attacker, uh, for example, uh, for example, browserlet. It uh, allows uh, an authorized uh, user uh, perform directory listing on arbitrary folder. But in case of exploitation, another servlet is more useful. Uh, file upload servlet allows uh, an authorized user uh, perform a file upload. Uh, and uh, uh, folder and a uh, folder is fully controlled by uh, parameters based dir and target name of http request this vulnerability can simply bypass uh, to remote code execution uh, for example attacker can um, uh, 
can corrupt uh, some startup scripts of SPPA or simply inject JSP shell in a uh, Tomcat web application uh, and, and, and get remote code execution with system writes. Um, also, there are servlets which has a service factory in its name. Uh, this servlet redirects HTTP uh, request to RMI services. Inside, it uh, uses uh, parameter uh, service URL of HTTP, of HTTP uh, uh, to identify RMI service, which will be called and uh, serialized object in a data section of HTTP request contains uh, information about method and arguments which uh, will be called. Uh, so uh, the situations when a theme client and fan client uh, can communicate uh, with, uh, with RMI services. But in case of fat client, uh, uh, RMI reg uh, RMI <coughs> In case of fat client, it can um, uh, communicate with uh, RMI registry. So if application server miss some important security updates of, of Java, then server, then server contains uh, insecure deserialization vulnerability and public available tool YSO serial can allow uh, exploit it and perform remote code execution with system rights on uh, server. So the next task will be to, to uh, to identify all input vectors for, for attacker, and uh, for this task, we will list. We will try to list all, all RMI services in system. At first step, we will use a class locate registry of SDK and get a big list of RMI services. All but one are GMX RMI services, and I assume that they used uh, to control and. Uh, manage uh, containers of SPPA. For first investigation, we will uh, choose lookup service. In fact, it looks like a collection of next level uh, RMI services and using its public methods, we can get uh, the reference to this next level RMI services. Uh, the next level RMI services should implement um, interface service factory uh, so, uh, it also looks like some collections of another next level uh, RMI services and uh, using uh, public method uh, get service and uh, parameters such as uh, client ID and name of the service. The instance of, RMI, of next level RMI service will be created and a reference to it will be returned to client. And uh, this next level RMI service is, uh, RMI is, is a server which perform real job of SPPI. But in fact, it contains a lot of uh, public, public methods which can be accessed by, uh, by an authorized user. Uh, so uh, input vector of SPPI is uh, very huge. Uh, the next question is, uh, to understand how authentication perform on a system. For this task, let's look how a client uh, perform request to uh, security service. Uh, to do this, uh, uh, first of all, client uh, try to get reference uh, on a security service with some client ID. In its two, PC service factory use this client ID uh, to get valid session in session manager. If session manager will uh, fail, then exception will thrown and client will be and client request will be rejected. But in case of success, uh, uh, valid uh, session ID will be returned to PC service factory, and in its turn, PC service factory uh, create instance of security service uh, where. Uh, where session ID will start in uh, in login ID, and a reference to this instance will be returned to client. Further, client can call uh, some public methods of uh, this service, and in its turn, uh, uh, these methods can perform some privileges checks of client. 
So uh, we have two security measures of system, uh, but uh, there's a question, how client can perform login operation on system if he doesn't have any valid client ID? Uh, for this task at startup of SVPA, uh, session manager uh, create anonymous session with client ID zero and um, client uh, used this client ID and perform login operation, but attacker can also use this and simply bypass uh, uh, this security measure. So uh, to sum up, uh, we have uh, uh, so with to, uh, there are a lot of RMI services which has a lot of uh, public methods and uh, permissions checks are fully delegated to this method. So it's uh, it's really difficult uh, to perform security management of this system. Uh, so we understand uh, all input vectors and uh, security manager measures. So it's time to uh, in the, uh, to find vulnerabilities. In the list of RMI services, uh, there is uh, admin service. Uh, it can be accessed by an authorized user and its public meta transcript doesn't have any privileges checks. In fact, inside it uh, first step, create instance of class loader using bytes uh, from arguments. Uh, in fact, this step uh, will uh, uh, load arbitrary Java class. This class should implement interface admin script and defined uh, method execute. This method will be called uh, by a run script of RMI services. For this case, uh, we create Java class, uh, which uh, simply run uh, OS uh, common, uh, and uh, this OS command will be run with uh, system rights. In fact, there is more powerful uh, post exploitation because uh, we inject uh, arbitrary Java class in around SPP software. So uh, we can use some Java reflection and patch uh, some private met of private variables of uh, SPP. And uh, as a result, we uh, can uh, corrupt some technological process of SPP. Uh, to bypass uh, privileged checks, privileged checks uh, in methods, as, uh, we can use a second vulnerability. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, uh, it's uh, uh, using uh, RMI service session service and its uh, public method get login sessions. Attacker can get uh, information about all uh, login uh, user on the system. Uh, this information contains uh, uh, user names, IP, and client ID of uh, login users. Attacker can uh, Uh, can reuse this, and if a uh, system uh, and uh, in is if in this information there is a user with uh, admin rights, then uh, attacker can uh, simply reuse uh, his client ID and get uh, the reference to security service with more privileged session. And after that, attacker can. Uh, uh, Call public method uh, get all users of security service, and as a result, get uh, all private information about all users on system. Moreover, password hashes also contains uh, in this information. Uh, uh, both of these vulnerabilities can be accessed uh, uh, from either uh, external or application network. Uh, all communications between RMI services are unencrypted, so username and password hashes are transferred in plain text. Uh, moreover, uh, system doesn't have any uh, session protection mechanism. Uh, this fact is uh, more critical in case of fed clients because of attacker can uh, perform mid attack on the user of SPPA and get um, valid username and password hashes from the traffic of user. And after that, uh, simply reuse um, this um, 
username and password hashes and perform login operation on the system. Moreover, uh, attacker can uh, also ch uh, change the password uh, of uh, the user. I talk a lot about password hashes and users, so it's time to understand how these items are organized on the system. So, Alex, you're welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Let's continue our discussion about application server. On the previous slide, uh, you could see how remote authentication works. Now I'm going to tell you about how it's organized locally. After the system gets started, uh, it begins to read the content of files uh, users1.xml and pdate1.exam to get a user list and uh, their password hashes. Uh, user1 uh, is a simple XML, while pdate1 has a slightly more complex structure. It's a gzip archive encoded in base64. Uh, there is a Java serialization object in the gzip uh, archive. Uh, containing uh, a specific XML. Uh, the field of this XML from uh, pdate one uh, file are presented on the slide. Uh, they are used to calculate uh, password hashes and uh, check it during user authentication. Uh, at the bottom of, of the slide, uh, you can see a password check algorithm in uh, a pseudocode. Uh, the cryptographic scheme is a typical crypt hashing scheme, like in your Unix and Linux machines. It has uh, sold to a different number of iterations, and the only one thing uh, which was added is a hard-coded sold. The same for all uh, users, uh, which is uh, concatenated to the password. Uh, the tool to extract password hashes and their parameters from a pdata1 uh, file has been developed. Uh, its output uh, is presented on the slide. Uh, the tool can be used during password auditing to check a weak or dictionary passwords and their uh, hash calculation parameters. The tool is available in uh, our GitHub uh, uh, repository. Draw the line under application server analysis. As you have seen, um, attack surface is uh, really huge and include Java RMI sources, Tomcat applications, and a lot of other. Uh, secondly, it's about uh, remote connections. Uh, whether the SPPA has or has not remote connections, according to vendor, system integrator, or someone else, uh, you should check it. And uh, the good starting point for this is application server, uh, because uh, OPC uh, maintains a remote operator. Uh, all of this uh, thing uh, will end up on application server. Uh, thirdly, uh, despite the fact that uh, there is automation network between application server and uh, field devices, an attacker uh, can affect uh, generation process from application server. Uh, this action uh, includes to start stop generation, change uh, power output, uh, or just get information how power plant works. Uh, of course, such ventilation will always be visible for operator, always monitoring uh, technological process so real attacker will also be required to change or modify uh, data on operators uh, hmis but it's also possible with uh, real security issues that's all about application server uh, now let's move on to another main component of uh, svpa infrastructure automation server automation server uh, the, main, the main goal of the automation server is to execute real-time automation functions and tasks, and tasks uh, for power plant control. Um, depending on uh, power plant uh, project architecture and uh, features, um, uh, the role of uh, the automation server can be different. We have distinguished uh, three roles, and the first one is automation. Uh, there may be a slight confusion because the term automation is used both for server and its role, but uh, analyzing um, automation server configuration and publicly available information about it, we have found that uh, whatever the role is, almost the same hardware and part of software are used. So we have decided to use this kind uh, of role classification, which seems less confusing to us, but at the same time, it's slightly different uh, from, the, from the vendor's one. Anyway, having an uh, automation role means uh, that uh, the server is responsible for interaction with input-output mo modules, which control and monitor um, power plant equipment, such as turbines or electric generator. The second role uh, is communication. Uh, this role is used to communicate with uh, third-party systems. Uh, in another words, it's just a protocol converter. Uh, 
supporting such protocols as um, Modbus, IAC 101, 104, and some others. And the last role is migration. Um, in this role, server um, um, is used to connect uh, previous version of SPPA, such as SPPA T2000 or Teleperm ME. Uh, in automation role, uh, automation server can be run both on Thematic 7 PLCs or industrial PCs. In case of uh, other roles, uh, it can be run only on industrial PC. Uh, let's uh, talk a little more about each role and uh, let's start with uh, automation role based on uh, uh, PLC. PLCs are what directly control field devices and access to them uh, is game over for any security discussion. Any configuration changes and updates for PLC uh, required to stop technological process. Uh, therefore, uh, these devices usually have um, security misconfiguration or, and uh, firmware without security updates. Another common security issue for PLCs uh, is using uh, um, unsecure industrial protocol protocols. Uh, in case of SPPA, uh, they are uh, Thematica 7 protocol and the PLC data protocol. Uh, there, are, uh, there is quite a lot of information about S7, but not so much about uh, PLC data protocol. So we had to deal with it and analyze it ourselves. It's not a special protocol for SPPA. When you program uh, your PLCs and you need to exchange some data between them in real time, you use this protocol. Uh, it's pretty simple, and uh, maybe um, its description is available somewhere in the internet, but we couldn't find it, so just in case, uh, show its structure here. here. Uh, it doesn't have um, any security mechanism, and the only obstacle uh, while do man in the middle attack to spoof data uh, is a sequence number, uh, which we can get from a packet and just uh, fuzzy implementation. Uh, for protocol analysis, the uh, Wireshark Dissector has been developed and also available in our repository. Uh, during uh, PLC security assessment, uh, one of the main things uh, which we check is uh, unauthorized uh, access to reading and writing uh, the PLC memory. Availability of unauthorized access is determined by the position of uh, mode selector of um, uh, thematic uh, PLCs and some other configuration parameters. The metrics on the slide um, shows uh, unsecure states for thematic PLCs when unauthorized access is possible. Uh, the tool for gathering information uh, from PLCs over the network and for its uh, analysis has been developed by one of our colleagues and uh, also available in our repository. Uh, now let's talk about automation server based on industrial PC. Uh, the workflow of all roles in this case is quite similar to each other. Um, when uh, automation server is based on industrial PC, uh, it's just a Linux box. Uh, during the start, uh, it tries to download some additional files from application server. Uh, these files include uh, jars, uh, which represent uh, runtime um, SPP runtime containers, uh, bar script, some configuration, uh, protocol configuration files, and other. In order to execute uh, uh, downloaded jars, uh, PTC PERC virtual machine is used. Uh, it's a um, real time uh, Java virtual machine, uh, widely spread in industrial and military areas. Um, after that, um, running uh, jars uh, open. Uh, RMI services or some of the extension. Uh, in case of migration server, uh, Orion RPC services, which are extension of classic Java RMI services are used. And you can see the listing uh, on the slide. Uh, automation server based on industrial PC uh, has following security issues. Uh, firstly, uh, there is a possibility to spoof uh, uh, downloaded from application server files. Uh, mm, these files are downloaded over HTTP and there are no security mechanism like authentication or integrity check uh, during this process. Secondly, it's about using default credentials, uh, user CM admin with password CM. 
Thirdly, it's uh, RMI services running on automation server. Uh, the research has found two vulnerabilities in uh, Arion RPC services, uh, which allow to perform sensitive data exposure and RCE. And the last group uh, is vulnerabilities um, found in the software uh, used to fulfill um, a migration role for connection previous version of SPPA. Uh, SPPA T2000, also known as uh, TXP. Uh, all these vulnerabilities uh, found in migration server software uh, are related to uh, different kinds of overflow, uh, stack, heap, integer, and other. Actually, uh, there are so many overflows here that uh, uh, this talk would be overflown by that uh, if we uh, started to describe uh, all these vulnerabilities uh, in details. Uh, if you words about RPC vulnerabilities, uh, uh, these vulnerabilities uh, have been found in uh, runtime uh, engineering service. Uh, uh, this service uh, has uh, a method, request runtime container, container uh, where the first argument um, defines uh, an action to be executed. Using the action read file, it's possible to read any file from the system. Uh, using uh, write config file action, uh, it's possible to write any file to any folder in the system. And for example, it can be jar file, which executes uh, com uh, shell command from the command line. Uh, and uh, then using uh, the same request runtime container method, it's possible to execute this, uh, uh, this jar later. That's all about automation server. To sum up, uh, automation server can be run on uh, PLC or industrial PC. In case of PLC, it's um, a usual PLC with well-known security issues. In case of industrial PC, it's uh, a Linux box, uh, which tries to download uh, jars from application server and uh, then execute them with PC per virtual machine. An attacker can uh, spoof downloaded files or just uh, exploit uh, revealed vulnerabilities in uh, network services. So far, we haven't mentioned uh, any network equipment uh, use, uh, used in uh, distributed control systems. Uh, during the research, we saw a wide variety of network devices and network infrastructure. Uh, they include different uh, kinds of uh, switches, routers, uh, firewalls, and more rare devices, such as Datadite, for example. Uh, we tried to summarize all this information and got um, common uh, SPPA network topology scheme presented on the slide. Uh, we have shown in purple uh, usual places for network devices, but it also, also should be mentioned that uh, the same devices in the same places uh, can, uh, can be found in other distributed control systems from other vendors. Uh, network devices in industrial network uh, usually have um, a lot of security issues. Uh, the reason uh, is uh, these devices uh, don't require any configuration and can be run out of the box. Uh, therefore, the things like uh, weak community strings in SNMP, weak credentials in HTTP, FTP, Telnet, and other services, firmware with publicly available exploits, and just um, security misconfiguration, all these things is common and typical for industrial network devices. Additionally, uh, some uh, industrial protocols, uh, for example, such as uh, Profinet DCP, can allow to get or set um, network configuration of these devices. In case of Profinet DCP, uh, uh, it's uh, in case of Profinet DCP, it also can be very uh, useful for device enumeration. And the last thing uh, about uh, industrial network devices is always remember that uh, these devices with years of uptime can act uh, unpredictably for completely uh, legal and normal activities, such as uh, browsing web page with statistic or login into Telnet. Here, my part is over, and now Evgenia will sum up uh, our speech. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. 
so the topic of uh, power plants is huge and the topic of DCS is huge. Uh, we just tried to poke a couple of things here and there and show that uh, to affect the power generation process, you don't have to go deep to the field level, to PLCs, uh, but you can uh, focus on uh, higher logical uh, levels uh, like application server and automation server. What we do not talk about today is havoc or damage that you can cause by such attacks. Actually, that's because it's not that bad. If you already imagine a hacker in a hoodie who writes a couple of lines and after that the entire city goes into the darkness, uh, it's not like that uh, because it's power grid who is responsible for power distribution. It is it's not a um, uh, power plant. Uh, so here we mostly talk about more local damage, like would it be possible to uh, damage a turbine? Uh, since uh, a turbine is connected to a DCS through PLCs, um, and the turbine is a giant mechanical monster, uh, and it self-degrades uh, by working, probably by putting it into different uncomfortable modes or quickly starting and stopping it, it would be po possible to make it degrade even faster or even break it. Um, we were not able to check it, uh, unfortunately, or actually this is fortunately, we were not able to find a spare turbine on eBay. Uh, but we are making an educated guess uh, that the damage is out there based on the system architecture. We wanted to make life of power plants a little bit easier and we prepared a small do it your own assessment guide uh, that you can use to check your SPP83000 system for vulnerabilities that we will discuss today. Um, you just uh, connect your laptop to a couple of places in the network, uh, go through a simple checklist. Uh, you don't have to hire expensive security consultants for that. And after that, you can fix some parts uh, yourself or you can uh, call your system integrators to uh, discuss uh, what to do further. Um, just any other uh, industrial system, uh, DCSs, are not uh, so good in terms of security, it could be better. Um, and we recommend you to uh, take a look at uh, ISA IC62443 uh, set of standards to know what to do uh, to improve security uh, in terms of uh, communicating with different uh, entities because uh, in the industrial area, it's usually a challenge uh, when you uh, for example, when a vendor is not interested to fixing something. Uh, so it uh, describes in particular uh, what kind of relationships uh, you can build with the regulators, with vendors and other parties involved in industrial area. Of course, update your systems, change your passwords, improve your configurations according to, to the vendor security guidelines. We also recommend you to set up monitoring since uh, most servers are based on standard Windows and Linux boxes. Um, you will not, able, will not be able to detect different Java attacks, but at least you will be able to detect some parts of attacks. Uh, and again, this is uh, more about uh, DCS and industrial security in general, rather than, than by one system by a single vendor. We released um, a lot of information, we released a white paper, different tools that we mentioned today. Uh, I recommend you to take a look at our GitHub page to find all of that. And we would like to thank uh, Siemens Product Cert who made all the communications very effective. They were very responsive. They allowed us to contact Siemens product team. And uh, of course they released um, the patch um, take a look at the advisory and um, Siemens um, always tries to raise awareness of their users, how to better build uh, such systems, uh, what are better configurations, but uh, they also highlight that uh, it's not the vendor who is solely responsible for security of an industrial environment. There are a lot of things that power plants, separators, uh, 
uh, can and must do themselves. Uh, so please follow their guidelines for that. Uh, that's all uh, for our talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and we will be glad to answer any questions.